That was a memorable day to me, for it made great changes in me. But it is the same with any life. Imagine one selected day struck out of it, and think how different its course would have been. Pause, you who read this, and think for a moment of the long chain of iron or gold, of thorns or flowers, that would never have bound you, but for the formation of the first link on one memorable day. I took the opportunity of being alone in the courtyard to look at my coarse hands and my common boots. My opinion of those accessories was not favourable. They had never troubled me before, but they troubled me now as vulgar appendages. I determined to ask Joe why he had ever taught me to call those picture cards jacks, which ought to be called knaves. I wish Joe had been rather more genteelly brought up, then I should have been so too. She came back with some bread and meat and a little mug of beer. She put the mug down on the stones of the yard and gave me the bread and meat without looking at me, as insolently as if I were a dog in disgrace. I was so humiliated, hurt, spurned, offended, angry, sorry. I cannot hit upon the right name for the smart. God knows what its name was. The tears started to my eyes. The moment they sprang there, the girl looked at me with a quick delight in having been the cause of them. This gave me power to keep them back and to look at her. So she gave a contemptuous toss, but with a sense, I thought, of having made too sure that I was so wounded and left me. But when she was gone, I looked about me for a place to hide my face in, and got behind one of the gates in the brewery lane, and leaned my sleeve against the wall there, and leaned my forehead on it, and cried. As I cried, I kicked the wall, and took a hard twist at my hair. So bitter were my feelings, and so sharp was the smart without a name that needed counteraction. My sister's bringing up had made me sensitive, in the little world in which children have their existence, whosoever brings them up, there is nothing so finely perceived and so finely felt as injustice. It may be only small injustice that the child can be exposed to, but the child is small, and its world is small, and its rocking horse stands as many hands high according to scale as a big-boned Irish hunter. Within myself, I had sustained from my babyhood a perpetual conflict with injustice, I had known from the time when I could speak that my sister, in her capricious and violent coercion, was unjust to me. I had cherished the profound conviction that her bringing me up by hand gave her no right to bring me up by jerks. Through all my punishments, disgraces, fasts and vigils, and other penitential performances, I had nursed this assurance, and to my communing so much with it in a solitary and unprotected way, I in great part refer the fact that I was morally timid and very sensitive. I got rid of my injured feelings for the time by kicking them into the brewery wall and twisting them out of my hair, and then I smoothed my face with my sleeve and came from behind the gate. The bread and meat were acceptable, and the beer was warming and tingling, and I was soon in spirits to look about me. Nothing less than the frosty light of the cheerful sky, the sight of people passing beyond the bars of the courtyard gate, and the reviving influence of the rest of the bread and meat and beer could have brought me round. Even with those aids, I might not have come to myself as soon as I did, but that I saw Estella approaching with the keys to let me out. She would have some fair reason for looking down upon me, I thought, if she saw me frightened, and she should have no fair reason. She gave me a triumphant glance in passing me, as if she rejoiced that my hands were so coarse and my boots were so thick, and she opened the gate and stood holding it. I was passing out without looking at her when she touched me with a taunting hand. Why don't you cry? Because I don't want to. You do, said she. You've been crying till you're half blind, and you are near crying again now. She laughed contemptuously, pushed me out, and locked the gate upon me. I went straight to Mr. Pumblechooks, and was immensely relieved to find him not at home. So, leaving word with the shopman on what day I was wanted at Miss Havisham's again, I set off on the four-mile walk to our forge, pondering as I went along on all I had seen, and deeply revolving that I was a common labouring boy, that my hands were coarse, that my boots were thick, that I had fallen into a despicable habit of calling knaves jacks, that I was much more ignorant than I had considered myself last night, and generally that I was in a low-lived bad way.